Hey there, network scientists. We have a big talk on the pod today. My guest is Martin Roswald, a network science legend, the creator of the InfoMap community detection algorithm. Now, Martin's group studies information flows through social and biological systems to understand their inner workings. And by simplifying these myriad network interactions into maps of significant information flows, they aim to address research questions about how diseases spread, how plants respond to stress, and how life distributes itself on Earth. In today's talk, we talk about how a love for theory and not the subject matter of classical physics made Martin study information theory early on. We talk about serendipitously going to the Niels Bohr Institute for his PhD work. And we talk about finding his postdoc advisor, Carl Bergstrom, on Google. And in a big reveal, a lazy pod exclusive, we tell the story of how a grumpy reviewer and a TV star resulted in the name for the map equation. And then we wrap up talking about Martin's yearly habit of taking young scientists into the Swedish wilderness. But enough chit chat, let's get to the show. Hey dude, thanks for hey. coming on the podcast. Thank you very much. Yeah. I think we should just jump into it because I have so much to ask about that yes. I want to immediately. Um... And I have so much to talk about. Yes, we have to. So, so let's let's do it. I poured a new cup of coffee. We have a we have a good connection, and I and immediately we have to go into uh, the Roswell origin story. How did how did you become a scientist? Um, so, so so tell me kind of uh, what like how who were you when you were a kid, and and what made you go in this direction. Yes. So, I mean, many have these nice stories about like, I'm the first generation doing science. I, I'm not like that. So we talked about science at the dinner table. Uh, both, my, both my parents are in uh, research in forestry. Yes. So it's like going to our summer cabin, we stopped uh, too often at uh, different locations and just walked in and looked at trees. Nice. And uh, I, I, I guess that somehow affected me. Uh, I realized that what I read in, in books is just one story and that story will change. Yes, yeah. that's cool. But so, so why, I guess my question is then, why did it become uh, physics or complex systems? Yeah, I think, so when you're 18, you think about life and death uh, yes. and you think about philosophy. So, so at that time, I was more, more, most excited in philosophy, about philosophy. Um, I, I wrote my, you know, um, when you're 18 in Sweden, you write a little thesis and I wrote it about consciousness and about yes, the existence cool. of God, nice. <laughs> how to, for someone who doesn't believe in God, kind of make up a story about God yes. and consciousness. Um, and I enjoyed that, but I realized that it's probably easier, um, to be a physicist and have philosophy as a hobby than the opposite. Yes, it just it, it was a, like a practical approach. No, I know exactly what you mean. I mean, I I actually also studied philosophy first when I started at university, like physics and philosophy in parallel, and I had very similar interests. and And after studying philosophy for a while, I just realized all the fun was in the physics. They were doing they were doing something. They were not just discussing what people had been, you know, discussing a thousand years ago or. 200 years ago. And I think to me, that's one of the things that's so awesome about physics is that it gives you a kind of, it gives value to your thoughts rather than just discussing other people's thoughts, which I think is, I mean, it's great too, but it's also uh, more boring sometimes, right? So, so that resonates with you, with me. But so my first memory of your work was the stuff you did on navigability, as we like to say, out in the business of cities that you did with Kim Sneppen. So at some point you found yourself at the Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen working with these um, 
uh, you know, complexity people. So, so how did you get, how did you get there? Yeah. I mean, you, you make a few important decisions in life and, and the most important decisions is when you make transitions. So yes. I, I studied, I studied physics in Umeå engineering physics and I liked kind of the modeling, uh, but I wasn't that interested in the problems themselves. Um, yes. I mean, like magnets and stuff that they were, they're not super sexy. No, uh, even though you can, the, the models are sexy, but not the magnets themselves. Uh, so then um, I, I got like in the final course, I had an offer from the teacher. It's like, well, I think you would do great in a master's project. Uh, and, and I felt like, okay, that's going to be epsilon uh, on top of this final computer lab we did. And, and yeah. I just, I mean, you, you, you don't, your, your horizon is very narrow, but some things you realize uh, also when you're a kid and that, that that would be like fun for two weeks and then it would stop me. Uh, so I, I wanted to expand the horizon and then I had this uh, opportunity to move down to Copenhagen. It was a, a similar story as Petter, who you met the, the other day. Um, so the head of the department in Umeå moved down to uh, Copenhagen oh, right. and he, yeah. And he wanted, he wanted a bridge between him being like at a more administrative position and the researchers so that he wouldn't be disconnected. And then he uh, thought that I would be that bridge. And that was perfect. Yes. Like I was at that point, like just thinking about the network, I had this perfect position between two important players. Yes, very cool. And yeah. also it's a good, uh, you know, it's a good, the, whoever funded Nordita, uh, you know, like they for sure had some downstream uh, success, right? Because this really kind of shows the power of also this, right? That we've now this is the second person whose life has been changed by this kind of meeting of the worlds, right? So, so it yes. also shows that some some science funding is is good, and and I think you're right that the transitions are are kind of crucial. Oh. Um, yeah, so, and, and then uh, in, in Copenhagen, we started thinking about, uh, I mean, already at that time, I was thinking about flows, flows on networks Yeah, uh, with Kim. And I mean, it was it was extraordinary uh, opportunity to work with Kim because, I, I mean, I, I know many uh, PhD students who kind of live with their books, uh, but I, I lived with Kim. Like he was always around and I was often in his office talking for hours. So, I mean, he was... Um, a real teacher in that way taught yes. me about science and how to do science and, and especially modeling and gave me the opportunity to write many papers like he had so many ideas and I had the ability to turn those ideas into papers yeah no I think I think that's also a really important part I think you know about becoming a scientist that if you can find this kind of relationship with someone where you can work really closely and begin as a young scientist to see what is it what does it look like and and have this kind of apprenticeship almost and i think that's one of the the sad things about science as it's developing and becoming bigger and bigger is that it's becoming more and more institutionalized and more and more impersonal as you say but but that there is a lot of value in transmitting you know, ideas through close collaboration. Um, and Kim, for sure, Kim, I mean, we should probably say Kim Sneben, who is yes. a who is a kind of a complex systems physicist and, and who has a close connection to this self-organized criticality and Pierre Bach and this whole complex systems uh, world. And he is kind of a proper crazy physicist. My main memory of him is that the first time I saw him and he was a teacher of mine at one point and he had like one sideburn down to here and the other one shaved off here that's the kind of uh you know he he was uh he was focused on the physics and not so much on the on the looks i guess that's no he's great and i mean like what you realize when you start your phd is that the phd is something else than studying like studying you you train for so many years answering questions but science is so much more, or research is so much more about asking questions and you have no practice. But he, he had it, he had so many questions and, and, and bombarded me with those. And, and then uh, and you have this mutual relationship where like he has ideas, 
but he doesn't have the time to test them. And yeah. as a PhD student, you have enormous amount of time and you can, in my case, you have your laptop and you write down a model and you test it and you have a figure and it's like, you can talk about this figure and then it kind of just goes on. We never, I mean, now when, I, when you write a research proposal and, and or kind of uh, decide what is my PhD student going to do for the next four years, you need a plan for those four years. We, we didn't have a plan for the next week. No. Um, I wrote uh, several papers, many papers during my PhD, but I was always afraid that I won't have any idea next week. But yes. something always came up. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's, um, it's really true. And it was a very creative time at the Niels Bohr Institute right around then. Were you part of this work on hierarchies and paths on network networks? I I was not on that paper. That was Ola Trusina, uh, yes. was the main author of that paper. But I remember, I remember, I was, yeah, I remember, I remember that paper. Yes. Yeah, it just struck me as a nice idea that never somehow, uh, <laughs> that, that never, uh, that I never saw saw again. Yeah. But but yeah, but but your the the biggest one I remember from that time is the one on navigability and where you think about how you move around the street network in an information theory sense. Yes. And, and so I guess my question is, how did you become, because information theory on top of physics has kind of become a trademark for you. So how did you get in touch with information theory? Because I don't think that's really something that was there in the, uh, in the standard physics education where I went. No, I, mean, I think it's, um... So what I liked with physics was uh, the simple models. What I didn't like was uh, the applications. You think about the textbook in physics, it's black yes. and white. You don't need color. F physics focuses on the simple problems. Biology has, take a textbook in biology, it's in color. You imagine a textbook in biology in black and white, it doesn't work. Yes. It's much deeper, but and that felt too rich and too complex. So how do you simplify biology and, and those problems? Well, information, is, uh, is, uh, information theory is a good approach because what you do is you focus on the sequence properties. You highlight some aspects and background some other aspects. And then suddenly you have a really cool system and you have the simple models. Uh, so, so then, I mean, I never taken a course in information theory, I learned uh, along the way. Right, so you had just had a kind of sense that it was there and then you, um, because I mean, back in those times, it's not like you had a beautiful Wikipedia that explained everything even, right? Like you would have to somehow go and dig up this information. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm was... asking because I remember thinking, God damn it, this is so cool. Like, why am I not coming across this? So I'm just curious about the actual process. Yeah, I think I learned through the papers. I mean, you, uh, you, you immediately learn about the entropy, channel entropy. And, and it's such a simple formula, but yeah. it's also so rich. Yes. So then, then I think it was through the papers I, I understood what it could do. Yeah. And what, what, uh, so what we did was asking, like, how many questions do I need to ask to get from one place in a city to another place? And uh, is, do different cities have different complexity in this sense? Yeah. And uh, what kind of topology favors navigability and, and so on? And then you had to, okay, what, what should we do? I mean, this is, it's an information game we need to navigate. We are asking yes, no questions. It's like, Shannon entropy, and then you build your intuition through uh, your modeling. So when you say you learn through the papers, just to be clear, it's through writing your own papers and basically yes. starting with the yes. formula. Yes. yes. And all, all, I have always enjoyed sitting with small examples. Like yes. in, the, in the paper, in most of our papers, we have like a schematic figure. That figure is, is most often a result of like, weeks of thinking about uh, like how the, the machinery, the inner workings of, a, of something. And yeah. then you, we scale it up to larger system to analyze things you can't analyze with pen and paper. Yeah, so, so it's like a, there's a process of building intuition through small examples. And once you have the intuition, that's when you can kind of move, exactly. move along and move forward. Yeah. That's cool. So, and so... A, key thing, a key thing about this navigability is that 
we talked about we, we're thinking about networks as like connected things so at that time um, many thought about them as topological objects like you have you have a bunch of links and a bunch of nodes and you think about how to combine them uh, but what key thing and this is something i got from kim that i mean you are connected with the rest of the network through your neighbors yes so we wrote a, a, several toy models about like social dynamics uh they were not so much about social dynamics they were more about helping us understand what a network is and how you how you're connected beyond your nearest neighbors yeah, no, absolutely. In those early days, the science was very much about just cataloging structure and coming up with new things to measure. And the work that you did both with the models and also with everything was very much about processes and sequences and, you know, like somehow already, yeah, beginning to think about network as these these things that are changing and where stuff is flowing on this changing object, right? And, and I think in a way, it's fascinating to me that we haven't at all grasped that yet, right? Like I, I still, when we think about how little we really have a good description of network changes and, and you know, processes on top of changing networks, it's my it's mind blowing to me, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a hard problem. It's yeah, it's a, it's really hard. But but yeah. I'm just yeah, it's it's just a it's it's just it, yeah, it's it's incredibly difficult. And it's yeah. it's how do we find kind of the lens through which it becomes simple? That's always right. the challenge, yes. right? Yes, and I, I mean, I should say that all these papers we we uh, we were PhD students in a in a good uh, time. Uh, I don't think you could publish these papers today. I mean, uh, because the field is so much more mature now. And these were like work in progress. Uh, we played and published. And uh, everything about networks it was hot at that time. Uh, sure. But, but don't you think that there is still a corner of, of, of network science where you can play like that? Still, it's just, I hope, it's just yes. that it, there's, in science, there's always a kind of uh, a mainstream where it's really well developed, there are conventions and you kind of know what's good and what doesn't work. And then there's like corners that are under exploration. And we were at an exploration corner that has now matured, but there are other exploration corners still. Yes, yes. Right? Yeah, so you, you, need, you just find them. Look for yes, them and find them. You need yes. it. And, but it's hard to find them. I'm not yes. saying like it's easy, but, no. but if you're lucky, uh, then yeah, you find yourself in the middle of one. By yeah, and I think that I mean that jumping that when you make those transitions, that's when when you have an opportunity. Yes, no, absolutely, and 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 I guess what I'm learning in in chatting with scientists is that a lot of times you can't plan it. You can't, of course, you can seek it out. You know, keeping your eyes open and so on, but it is random, right? It's random yeah. what you run into. It's random that your advisor gets a position at Nordita that takes you to Copenhagen and puts you near someone who is, who is doing this, right? And it's not like through some great planning of yours. It's, no, it's hard to plan that, yes. Yes, but that's, a, that's, that's fantastic. And then I guess before we get to talking about, uh, yeah, we don't even have a real paper because InfoMap is so big that I can't, and I've read a lot about it, so I, but I, I still, so, so we, we can't even have the foil that there's a paper I haven't read, although there are some. Um, but but um, before we get to talking about InfoMap, you also found yourself at uh, University of Washington at some point. Um, so, so how did you then decide to go there? Like, what is the process of getting out of Copenhagen and now going to- uh, and, and also getting out of this uh, complexity world that you mentioned. So, so I yes. mean, another important transition. You, uh, I mean, a common choice here is to follow your uh, supervisor and look at uh, his or her collaborators and go to them. And um, I had that opportunity, but I th that was more into like the detailed biology uh, yeah. and uh, maybe also lab work, and and I didn't feel that was my my thing. 
And um, so, I, I mean, I was, I was uncertain, like, do I have it? I know I can solve problems, but can I ask questions? I, I didn't know because Kim was so good at it. Yeah. Uh, so so I, was, I was uncertain, like, can I make it in science? Um, I asked around. Uh, I got some advice from uh, older people, uh, more senior researchers. And, the, and the one advice was, like, your postdoc is only about your CV. Go to uh, uh, Nobel laureate and uh, st stick there for two years, come back with some important papers, and then uh, uh, enjoy tenure. That was kind of the advice. And that felt, uh, I, I mean, I couldn't do that. Uh, I, I had to have fun like every day. Yeah. So um, what I did was I, I actually Googled my interests. And I remember the query was information evolution biology. Nice. And, uh, and Carl Bergstrom showed up. And I started reading about his work uh, on signaling theory. And it sounded really great. And it was, uh, it was kind of this, what I mentioned before, uh, looking at the beauty of biology with um, the lenses of information theory. It was perfect. Yeah. And I could do that, like take that to the next level. Uh, so I wrote to Carl, and no response. I mean, this is to everyone who writes to uh, some uh, cool guy and never gets a response. I didn't get a response. I wrote again, and I got a response. So it's like it paid off to try again. Yeah. And uh, he invited me. Uh, this was winter, the winter before I started my postdoc. Uh, I flew over there, and he invited me to his his house. I stayed at his house. Nice. I mean, this, this says something about the commitment. And um, we, I mean, we had a good time. I, um, I remember we went to the mountains. He took me to the mountains with Jevin West, who I also worked with later. Yeah. Uh, skied for a day. And, and, you know, in Copenhagen, I, I loved being at the Niels Bohr Institute, but I really missed the snow and, um, and the kind of the outdoor life that I've grown up with. And that's yeah. still part of my life. And I thought I could live without that, but during my PhD, I, I realized I need that. I need yeah. that kind of balance. And when I saw that uh, the amount of snow they had so close to Seattle, I realized, okay, I, I, this, this is, this, I need to go here. I, had, I actually had these other opportunities, this CV uh, track to go to uh, famous names. And, uh, but I, I pictured that as being postdoc number seven in a long corridor. Yeah. And that, that didn't attract me. And instead, I went to Carl and, and kind of uh, realizing why that was important, uh, not only because of his qualities and so on, but also because he was at a stage where he, he needed me. Like he worked toward tenure and the full professorship, and he was, he was working hard on, on um, writing good papers. And, uh, and we could do that together. And that was a blast. So um, I mean, that, that was the reason I, I, I chose like passion and I, I moved out of my box and, uh, and went there and found uh, a wonderful place. Yeah. And, and it's one more mentorship also, right? Uh, if, if we think about this kind of mentor apprenticeship that it's, it, it seems like it was a very close collaboration between the two of you um, and that he he also shaped a lot, but he, yeah, he must have been quite young when you visited, right? Yeah, I mean, I, that, that's something you realize later because you, I mean, he felt so much more mature. <laughs> yes. He's done all these steps. But then uh, when you look at his age uh, now, you realize that he was then younger than I am now. Yeah. Uh, and by several years. So, so he was at the, he was a young researcher, but he was, um, I mean, he, he had skills I hadn't met before. He's a brilliant writer, and uh, I always enjoyed writing. But he he helped me take that to the le next level. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I I remember, but but you you like writing and like picking apart the writing. I know from reading your paper. But you are also like you talked about these black and white physics books. But yeah. I still remember like your beautifully typeset manuscripts with you know, like a subset circle and coloring to show how the various variables yes. hang together. So you also find, and I mean, and the network plots in the, in the first InfoMap papers was so gorgeous. So you must also have some kind of um, 
appreciation for the aesthetics of it, right? Like there's something like you, you kind of said, you like the simple models, you like the mathematical description more so than, you know, like a friction or a whatever. Um, yeah. But, but, but the, you also have some joy in creating. And I think we share this in creating papers as kind of beautiful, perfect objects. Is that a fair description? No, I think so. I mean, it. Uh, I mean, it, it's about communication. It's like how I, I know something and I want to tell you about it, and how can yes. I do this in the best way? And uh, it doesn't stop with the the words you put on the page. You need those figures, and they should be. I mean, it, the same, they should be as clear, as concise. I mean, the same attributes that we put that at good writing. Um, and then also just uh, typography. It, it belongs to the same class. Typography is about communication. Yes. Like you want, you want to use the right symbols, uh, the right fonts and so on, uh, because they also convey information. So yeah, this, no, and th th this is a, it's a fun game to try to improve this because it's so hard and, and uh, I'm trying to improve every day. No, absolutely. But I think it's, I, I guess the game that I'm playing is a little bit different. Like what I like to do and what I think is a luxury of science is to make something that's as good as I can make it in a world of so like in a world of things that are shitty yeah. <laughs> of so many things and people not giving their all or being afraid. I love this idea that we have like a little corner for us where the goal is to create objects where we go like, I, I couldn't make this better. Like this is now as good as I can make it. And I think to yes. me, that's like the greatest luxury in it that I can imagine. Yes. Make sense? Yes, yeah, yeah. No, I, I know this because um, I mean, we use tax money, uh, tax money to, to do this and we have this opportunity. We also, I now have a university startup. We don't yeah. have as much money for kind of beautifying things. So this like good enough comes at a different level. And I, and I have to say that I, I enjoy doing things until I can't make them better. Yes. And I, and I agree. I mean, you can't do that in a business, right? It's not, no. you, you just, you make it so that it works. That's awesome. Um, yeah, that's the reason to do science essentially. Yeah. And, yeah. and Bergstrom has also now kind of become uh, a famous person on Twitter during COVID and as a bullshit caller. So was that surprising to you to see that that happened or does it make perfect sense or? I think it makes perfect sense. He's interested in uh, flows of information through social systems and biological systems. And, and this, uh, this is like the next step. He started with animal signaling. Uh, then when I came there, he was interested at that time I mean, uh, important thing here is that I moved to Carl to stop doing networks. I, I didn't want to do networks anymore. Uh, I wanted to do information uh, evolution biology. Yeah. Uh, at that time, he was inter interested in networks because he was interested in flows through those systems. He hadn't done much. Uh, but I, when I came there, that was kind of his way to... Uh, I brought some skills and some uh, ways of thinking. And then uh, he's taking it to the, to the next level now with the uh, calling bullshit and yeah. done an amazing job. But the calling bullshit also connects, at least in my mind, to another aspect of what's important about good science, which is common sense, right? That, that, that in a lot of this, common sense is still a superpower, like taking a step back and thinking and saying, what is the simple information and not just throwing on more theory, I think is also important. And I feel like I see that in your work to some extent. And I wonder if, I mean, and calling bullshit is all about common sense, right? It's about thinking about it. So is that also something you learn something about with him or is it just naturally also part of your work or? I mean, that, that part feels also natural to me. So I, I borrowed uh, some of his uh, work and I, I uh, teach uh, kids here in Sweden about it. And, yeah. and uh, I will, uh, so next month, I will talk about calling bullshit to PhD students in the UK. I mean, I think, I think it's a super important topic. And uh, I think it's one of the things that 
we can give back to society. We get money from them, we discover new things, but it's not only the discoveries, it's also how we do it, the process. Yeah. And, uh, and learning about common sense in a kind of a scientific way. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's super cool. I'm going to just make a note here because I want to talk about your institution building later with the ice lab and stuff, but we'll come back to that. I want to take a small detour and then uh, talk about InfoMap. So the thing, thing I want to talk about is I, I remember at one time we were both at the Santa Fe Institute and, and Dmitry Kriokov said, let's go hiking. And then I went hiking with Jure Leskovich and Dmitry Kriokov. And I was unprepared for hiking in the US, right? Like I'm, I'm like, I'm the city person. So we start walking up. Dima is in like hiking boots. He has trail mix. He has the Patagonia shirt and uh, he's, he's ready for hiking. I just have like a pair of, you know, like shoes totally unfit for this. And then we start and, and in the parking lot, we see uh, you also arriving to go on a hike and you immediately go like, I'm going on my own hike. <laughs> <laughs> and you just like take off. And then we go up the mountain and my experience was kind of like, I, I go up there, Dima can handle it very quickly. There's like snow, the path disappears. Yura is like a super, you know, like he's just, he wants to beat everyone and win. So he just, he powers through. And I'm like, I would like just to survive this trip because the mountains in it, it's no fun. And I then, remember so, your so, face. <laughs> so, so they want to, so they both want to keep walking. I'm like, let's just go down sit quietly and eat a sandwich or something and so so at some point you know they're very disappointed but we have we turn around after getting to some little turnaround place and then when we come down we we find out that you went to the top of the mountain that that same day right so so you have some kind of both experience but you were also in insane shape and you also did um uh, cross-country skiing yes so talk a little bit about how that yeah, connects, like who, how that, what that's like and how it connects to your life. And I mean, uh, I've, I've always, I skied as a kid. I skied, yeah. uh, I went to actually to a high school for cross-country skiers. I skied, yeah. uh, some, some of them uh, ha have now gold medals from the Olympics. Uh, I didn't. Uh, for me, it was like after high school, um, I want to focus on college. Uh, I yeah. remember th at that tr transition, I went to a summer research school. Yeah. And that was like the perfect chance to stop skiing. Yeah. Like six weeks in southern part of Sweden uh, with the uh, other research interested students. Uh, but okay, uh, let's bring the running shoes and roller skis. And I use them every day. And, and then I realized, okay, that this is, it's going to be hard to stop. And I went to Copenhagen. It's uh, it's it's not like skiing, ski a skier's paradise. I uh, roller skied in the industrial port of uh, Copenhagen. Yeah. Between like three layers of containers. I know. And and kind of needed that. I felt good after doing that. And uh, and then one day, one day I found a roller ski pole tip, and realized there are other skiers around. And then I, I met the Copenhagen Ski Club. And, and then that kind of changed things. And I realized that I need, to, I need both. And that's also one, one reason why I went to Seattle, because I saw that I could get both there. Yeah. And so, so I basically, I'm the skier who never stops. I'm still skiing. I'm still racing. And, and I enjoy it. I enjoy it. And um, yeah, you can, you can kind of reboot your system. A hard day at work. You suffer and you go home and then you go out for a run or ski and then you come back and then you're a new person. Yeah. So, so this is something I've uh, always been doing. And uh, so it's, it's kind of natural for me. You go to a, a new conference. I mean, I choose, choose conferences based on the outdoors. Yeah. Uh, Santa Fe is excellent. And then I, and it's my way to explore their surroundings. Yes. And, and I've, so I, I enjoy that much more. Like I enjoy comp company also, like, uh, 
I, I would like I, I when when I can. <laughs> uh yeah. I, I i run with people and and i prefer that over going to a bar at a conference for example yeah no no no. i remember you running around uh at conferences yeah. uh yeah. In, but normally in the early morning i guess but i because yeah but some some conferences are excellent i remember the nips conference in uh, vancouver it was my first conference as a phd student where we yeah. had a, i actually met aaron at that time so so that was uh way back um and uh we we had like four hours for skiing in whistler in the middle of the day that's a perfect conference yeah no i remember um i did a tiny amount of uh alpine skiing and i remember this that that was a feature of the of the uh nips conference then that there would be they were even had workshops up in whistler right yeah yes. um, so so uh, it's, um, yeah, so I mean, this is something I, I've learned I need it. Uh, and now when, I, when we have kids, I have less time for it. So I'm, I kind of, I don't train as much, but I'm still training enough to feel that I, with just a little bit more training, I could be as fast as before. Yes. But and can I ask how old are you? Uh, I'm 42. 42. I think. So, good age. 43. For, assume 43 okay yes it's a it's a it's the answer uh to life uh, the universe and everything yes. that you are at now but yeah but uh, it's but it's also it's be, i'm just i mean we should get off this track because now it's just old man talk but i'm beginning to feel like i'm a little bit older than you and i'm beginning to feel that now i can't just train a little bit harder and be in good shape like it's now it's finally downhill but anyway let's uh but i, th I think that the the message is that it's it's good to have something else than science a hundred percent i i really think so i really think so and i think it's a um, yeah it there, there are so many so many reasons and of course at the same time it's also wildly personal if someone said you know what i like to think science 24 hours a day and that's what i'm doing probably that's that's also so so fine but i i find i i have a similar uh, i have a similar worldview that you have to somehow that i guess it's it's again it's if it's about creativity then your brain needs space like you can't just have only input there needs to be times when it does something else. And that's oftentimes, it's not that like inspiration strikes the second you get out of the house and do something else, but it's, but it, uh, yeah, I, I feel that space is, is, um, is really important. And if you're too stressed and too working, then creativity becomes even more difficult than it already is. And as you say, it's, it's, not, always, uh, it's not always easy. But uh, let's get back, let's get back to, um, Let's or not. Let's get back, but let's talk about InfoMap, right? So, so we're now back in two thousand and um, six. I yeah. I, I arrived to uh, Seattle and University of Washington in uh, early October two thousand six, and and you know, remember my mission was to stop doing uh, network science. So yes. I remember the first couple of weeks I read about economics animal signaling game theory and uh, and like after working with kim and always having a paper in the workings after two or three weeks i felt like i'm not producing anything so i felt like i have to jump on a project that actually results in something and i had this idea how you could uh, turn uh, well, simplify networks and identify communities with uh, an information theoretic approach but let's, I just want to set the scene and kind of think about where we are in, because community detection uh, became a huge, huge topic, right? And I don't think there's any uh, network scientist that hasn't done some community detection to split up the network. And as I remember it, like some of the early work that I saw was Mark Newman. And the, the early idea was this idea of looking at betweenness, which is in a little bit you know, connected to walks and flows and so on. And then you would iteratively uh, remove edges with high between us and slowly the uh, network would fall apart. And then he came up with a kind of metric for how good um, 
the split into communities was, which he called modularity. And then very quickly, he realized that you could just optimize that. And that became a huge thing. And so many people were kind of optimizing modularity and thinking about ways to optimize modularity. So what, like, how, how does, this is kind of the world, I can't remember like the exact timeline, but this is the world that you're coming up with this in. So, so what were you thinking about this literature and, you know? I mean, it, I hadn't done any, <clears throat> anything on the community section during my PhD, but I, I, I remember realizing that this was something people thought was important. And uh, I also had this idea that, I mean, this is what the information theory is about. And there hadn't been, there was like one, one paper attempting to do some information theory on this before, but I had that what I thought was a simpler idea. Yeah. And, um, and, and uh, the idea was basically that if you, if you think about the network as a set of links and nodes, uh, how, in how many ways can you combine the links? And how much information do you need to describe that? And if you instead split the network in uh, two parts and, and assuming then the, that the network structure has two parts, how, many, how much information do you need to describe this with, with this structure? And then you soon realize that you can compress the message a lot. And, and uh, I hadn't seen the word stochastic block model at that time, this, but this as, is, a, is a stochastic block model. Um, and we wrote a paper about that. And, and I mean, I, it's, it's crazy, but I think I started early November and uh, it was on the archive in early December. Yeah. Uh, and th this doesn't happen anymore. No, Peter um, was talking about the same thing, this yeah. kind of uh, the fast. Yes. And, and then, um, I mean, and this is not InfoMap. This is a, a method uh, that happened before and uh, that actually Tiago has built on later. And, and uh, I mean, we did some approximations and he has done a much better uh, principle work on how we should have done it in the first place. So, yes. Um, but what we had there was a paper uh, where we could identify communities and a method that we could identify the communities, but we were interested in directed networks because Carl was interested in the uh, citation networks. So we had in the, in the kind of conclusion, this method could be easily generalized to directed weighted networks. Yes. And then, uh, because we thought about uh, like, okay, this is a combinatorial problem. We could put uh, weights, uh, weights may be difficult, but at least directions and it should work. Uh, but then it's like, what, what does direction mean? And then thinking about what I had done during my PhD, direction is really about that the interdependence between links, that this yeah. that points to this node that points further and so on. So we removed that and that was good uh, because th that, that would have been something else. And then, and then uh, I started thinking after that paper, okay, how do we deal with flows? And then just, well, back to the random walkers, a simple model and uh, come up with a kind of combine what I did during my PhD and then this information theory uh, and minimum description length principle that we have had worked on with the, with the first paper. Yes. So there it was, uh, uh, I mean, work by Claude Shannon and Jorman Rissanen, uh, who, who developed information theory and the minimum description length principle. The idea that you can compress a description if you find regularities in the description. Yeah. We wanted to take that idea to flows. Yes. And I think and, it's and kind of... That's the kind of beginning of the map equation stuff. Yeah. And I think it's, it's also ingenious to think about flows, right? Because if you think about just the, com or the, let's say the entropy of uh, some network neighborhood, like it's easy to compress a star, but it's equally cheap to compress a fully connected graph, right? Yes. The complex high entropy state is when you're in between the two because that's when you need to specify where all the links are. But 
and but it's somehow counterintuitive and i remember sort of when i started thinking about it i'm like well how is the clique the simple thing but it's exactly because of process it's because everything can happen in a clique and i think by putting the walkers on there you capture this in a very very natural way exactly so if you are in a clique and you forget which node you are at you have lost no information yes because it doesn't matter where you are yeah and and that is what the, the map equation exploits that is like when you describe movements within with the entropy, entropy term that's the assumption you make that it doesn't matter which node you are at exactly but all i'm saying is but the state is i mean like that yeah the the yeah, anyway, it's I, I think it's it's also a detour in terms of info map, but but I just I just think that that the, this focus on process really captures you know what's what's going on on the network. And so this is the beginning of info map uh, that that you basically you get this idea that you can use the minimum description length uh, and and you can find are are there ways to in put a little, I, I guess you should explain it. So, so maybe just like explain it a little bit uh, with the code books and stuff, or maybe not, maybe it's a waste of- I, I mean, uh, the, idea, the, the, idea, the idea is, I mean, we, if you take a simple network, we can imagine that we have two clicks and then they have a weak connection in between so that we can visualize it without paper. Um, if you would put all nodes, say there are 20 nodes in total uh, in one community, and then describe movements between them, you would need um, unique code words for 20 nodes. Yeah. And uh, because there are only so many short code words, you have to use some long code words. So that will be a relatively long description. So the idea is simply that, what if I could use one code book for one community? So then one community is only you, and you only need to specify 10 different nodes. And that's cheaper because you can use the short code words and reuse them in the other code book. You can use the same code words. Yep. And, uh, and then, uh, okay, that, so then you've done that, but then you realized, okay, this is a communication game. I need to be able to tell you about where the worker is. So then if I'm using two code books, we have some ambiguity. Like, which one are you talking about? So then you'll have also to uh, des uh, describe when you're moving between them. And, and that's the map equation. It's nothing yep. more. Exactly. But then what I think is, one thing that I think is really fascinating is that after this insight and, and writing this algorithm that, you know, for many years and maybe still is one of the, uh, kind of best ways of finding meaningful communities in network. And by the way, one that can also capture uh, directed networks in, in a really interesting way that I, you know, um, then you, you really worked with it, generalized it to a number of interesting cases, but you've also worked with people like I know who kind of came from the modularity world and really found kind of deep, connections between what's going on. So maybe you can talk a little bit about sort of the path moving forward from this. Yes, I mean, first, uh, I, because I read the review reports uh, yesterday to kind of remind myself about this. And in the first version, we- um, Oh yeah, of course. Uh, we, uh, we just presented the method and made no comparisons. We, we didn't talk about other methods. No, and and then, and then uh, the reviewers uh, rightly complain that uh, I mean, is this a uh, please validate? Does this make sense compared to other methods? And at that time, the the natural comparison was uh, with uh, modularity. So the in the paper we have a section about uh, the map equation versus modularity, and that happened in the revision. And and uh, I mean, many many researchers who have written papers on community action they have I got this question from uh, reviewers like please validate compare it and and at long after this i mean it's two uh, one one or two years after at least uh we started having these benchmarks 
networks, but there wasn't any good benchmark networks at that time. And we didn't want to fall into that trap of like benchmarking map equation against modularity because they do different things. Yes. So if, if you have a benchmark, then you have this implicit assumption that they are trying to achieve the same thing. Yes. So, so we fought back there and then instead provided an example that showed here's a network, a simple network, and the modularity finds this, the map equation finds this. Depending on what you are interested in, you should use modularity or you should use the map equation. And that has been kind of, a, I mean, something that we've always been thinking about, but I think, I don't think it was until like Aaron and Lito and uh, Dan wrote this um, ground truth paper, ground truth about the, community detection and metadata in, I think, 2017, that the community realized that we're trying to do different things. No. Because we had had these benchmark networks for so long time. And, and the reason, I mean, the reason why I'm doing, still doing community detection, I mean, my plan was that, okay, I do one more network science paper and it's going to be this, and then I will stop. Yeah. The reason why I continued is because um, these, people devised these benchmark tests and Infomap showed up doing well. And people started requesting uh, uh, the algorithm and uh, wanted to collaborate and so on. And I and wanted to do hierarchies uh, and stuff. And, and we, uh, it was so easy to generalize. Yes. No, no, I mean, don't get me started on uh, benchmarks, right? Because no. the, the paper that we wrote in 2010 or so about overlapping communities we had huge problems with benchmarks, right? And so in that paper, we were trying to make the point that maybe communities aren't what you think when you think about a block model, right? Like maybe communities aren't separate, densely connected groups with sparse interconnections in between. Maybe there's something else. So we came up with an idea to, uh, to capture this something else. And then people were like, you should try them on benchmarks. And we are like, no, because the benchmarks you know, exactly reproduce this idea. Um, so, 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 um, so I, I vividly remember. Uh, I, I think you have benchmarks in the paper, right? But so, but the way that we did benchmarks was ground truth. Yeah. So, so basically we said, we're gonna find a, a lot of networks that have ground truth, and then we're gonna test it on the, on, so, so we, I mean, we, we just in talking to people about it, almost it's it's kind of surprising in a way but almost no one recognized that it was an issue that the benchmarks it, it, it's because community detection is as you say each really distinct algorithm comes with a philosophy of what the communities should be like and a benchmark must be an expression of this philosophy or concept of what communities look like and so it was very scary to us so 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 we we realized that this would be a problem so we kind of preemptively found many networks with um ground truth and then we came up with um and then we came up with four different measures of what it meant to do good community detection in there in terms of the the labels that were on the nodes in the in the network, and I fully admit, should be saying that, in comparing our algorithm to Infomap, we were incredibly unfair because we had one metric which was called overlap quality, which basically says that if a node has multiple labels, and that correlates well with the multiple communities, then you score highly on this metric. But clearly you need overlap in communities to score well. So Infomap uh, didn't fare so well in that comparison. And that might've been a little bit unfair, but at the same time, if you're arguing that overlap is important and multiple belongings uh, to communities is important for a node, then uh, it's maybe not so bad, but we did. Oh, I mean, a it's, a, it's it. a good paper and it has inspired us to, uh, to build on that idea and, and we can come back to that later. So I, I think what, one uh, cute story about the Infomap paper is uh, that, I mean, we do random walks and we do compression. 
So uh, one uh, argument is that, like from the reviewer is like, we don't do maximum compression because if you do maximum compression, you, you have the entropy rate of the random walker. Yeah. Uh, and um, so, so that was something we had to, we struggled with, like how can we motivate that we should have entropy terms for the communities and not for the nodes? Mm -hmm. Because the, the entropy rate is, is like putting the entropy on each node. So what you do is you describe uh, where you're going in each step. Yeah. And, and uh, so, so then, uh, I mean, we were sitting there in, the, um, in, his, in Carl's, in our lab, and, uh, and Carl was started thinking about Dora, you know, the, the cartoon, the, the girl yeah. with maps. Yes. And... Uh, and she has this map and she has to go like from A to B or from the woods to the lake or something. And then it's not, it's never like go left, go right, go straight and so on, because that's very confusing. Yeah. If you, if you are, uh, you just happen to move to another place, that description doesn't make sense. S those maps are worthless. Uh, yeah. But her maps were like first follow the path for follow the trail cross the bridge and so on like they she named important objects with unique words yes and and that's what we do with the with the map equation and that's why we call it the map equation that's why it's a map ah, because we, nice because we put unique words on important objects and uh, important, so we have unique names on the communities, but then we reuse the important words within the communities because it, it's not confusing. You can talk about the same street names in different cities, you know the context, and the context, yeah. context is the community. So that, Dora helped us there. Very nice. I had no idea that that was the origin of the map equation. I do, did have a sense of finding a way and, and um, and I mean, this also connects to the short paths in social networks, probably, right? Like I remember some of those models that Duncan Watts and those guys did to explain uh, navigability in social networks and, and the Milgram experiments. And it's a kind of similar idea that you first navigate on, let's say, space, and then when you get to a place, then you navigate on other social dimensions. So, so that's a that's a really nice insight. And I think that's how that's how human navigation works, right? I think it's a, it's a nice, uh, yeah, yeah, by the way, we... there's a great uh, reboot of Dora the Explorer as a, as a kid's movie that I recommend uh, oh. wholeheartedly. Uh, yeah, because now, so my kids are at about the same age now uh, as uh, Carl's kids at the time. Yeah. So, so, so now we, are, we have entered Dora time. So but there's good. a really good kind of, uh, so how old are they? Three and six. Three and six. Okay, so when they turn, um, I don't know, six and nine or five and eight or whatever, there's a kind of, re there's a great Dora movie uh, with uh, live action. That's super good. Uh, On my list, very good, yeah. No, so, uh, so you, you asked about like what happened after and uh, yeah. it was basically, reviewers pointed out uh, one thing, it's like, why two levels? It seems that you sh why not focus on multiple levels? Yes. And, and uh, there again, we had, we had no real good answer. It was like two, why two levels? Like why communities and nodes? And it's like two, I mean, I remember we joked about this. Two is the smallest integer larger than one. Like one is trivial and not interesting. And two is the first non-trivial thing. Uh, but then we realized that, I mean, the math is, is trivial to generalize. Uh, the map equation is in itself recursive. So you have these layers. The challenge is just to write a good search algorithm. And, and that I did uh, when I came back from the US. The other thing was change. So uh, we, we, I mean, I was sitting there with my small examples and then we have had the map of science or the citation network of science. And we, 
I put together an algorithm that could deal with that. And we got out the map and I started like drawing it. And uh, after many feedback cycles, we had something that we could show other people and we showed some other people. And uh, one of the first reactions was, uh, this map is wrong. Chemistry is too small. They were chemists, we asked chemists. Chemistry is too small and physics is too big. And um, okay, so uh, you, you have done something wrong with the algorithm. So we went back, checked the algorithm, and, um, and then dug up some uh, old, older data. Like we used data from 2004. We had citation data also from 1995, and we used that instead, and uh, created a new map and showed it to the chemists, and they, they were super happy. Like, now, now it's good. Chemistry is big, and uh, this is what it, uh, what it should look like. What, what was wrong with the algorithm? And... Um, I mean, then we realized that things change over time and we need a good method to separate real change from noise. Yes. Uh, so and then we had the mapping change paper. And, and then um, it was this thing with um, overlapping things. Like you had the link communities, which is, uh, which I saw like how you could do that by extending these flows to multiple steps. Yes. Like if, if you can have, if, instead of talking just about where flow is a description of where you are and where you're going, it's also where you came from and where you're going. Then you have paths and with paths, you can actually um, deal with overlapping communities because you can, I mean, the example you gave, you have these nodes um, that sit on the boundaries between communities. Like you have your friends and then you have your colleagues and information will, from your colleagues will come to you and typically return to your colleagues and the other way from your friends. And, mm -hmm. and uh, so information stays within these communities and that's what we capitalize on with the map equation. And yes. by looking at not only where you're going but also where you're coming from, we could deal with that. And, and so then we had like networks with memory. So, so yes. this is like, I tried to stop doing this, but there were these like low hanging fruits. Uh, I saw we could solve in a simple way. And, yes. and therefore that's why we did it. But I, yeah, and I, but I also think it's, it's really, really worthwhile because each insight shows something important about networks, right? Like the, that the overlap exactly says, well, it has to do with memory. Like if the message knows that it came from one of my, I mean, now we're, but, but if the message came from one of my friends, it's much less likely if, if at the note that I know this, it's much less likely that it is a message that will be conveyed to my mom, but yeah. it's likely that it's one that will be conveyed back to my friends, right? This is a deep insight about what it is that's generating them. And it's also a deep insight about how to take something very complicated and capture it in a, in an incredibly simple mechanism, similarly with the hierarchies, similarly with the flows and so on. So I think each discovery is a new version of the map equation, but it's, it's more than that. Um, and, and so, and I remember this, that when we did a paper much later about uh, communities in time, your InfoMap paper on, the temporal development of this citation network was um, was one of the only ones at that time. So it was also very kind of um, you could, you were kind of way too early on the uh, temporal <laughs> temporal community, right? Uh, so so I think it makes sense. Maybe you can talk a little bit. I don't have a good intuition here, but now I'm just curious. So so nowadays the big hype has to do with embeddings and and kind of graph embeddings and so on. So, so is, is there some kind of easy to understand connection between InfoMap and that stuff? I, I don't, I, I can't talk about it uh, in, in few words uh, now. That, that's something we need to explore more. Yes, all right. But, but think, uh, it, it's something we are exploring. Yes, because there seems like when you think about the maps, right? Like what you're doing with embed, like I was thinking about in, in and a project that we're actually collaborating on, we're building embeddings for very big networks. And 
and and so like the thing that made me think of this connection was when you said um why two and it's and like one of the things is how many dimensions do you need to to get to kind of capture the structure yes. of a network right as, as you're doing it and so so i think that somehow connects to that question but yeah that's for the next uh, the next podcast yes next podcast uh, episode no. Yeah, now so so it's like it's it's this uh, important papers like your link community paper that make you think about um, how, in, in my words, with my apparatus, how what can I do? How can I kind of shed some light on this uh, aspect? And so what we are working now is incomplete information, and that's also like inspired by work by other researchers where they used. Uh, uh, the map equation for link prediction something we had never thought of like using the map equation for link prediction why, why do that but but uh, then and then uh, showing the shortcomings of of that doing that and then we realized the pros and cons of the map equation so the map equation assumes that you have all the data and then it works very well but if you don't have all the data which is often the case um, you uh, and especially when the network becomes so sparse that it falls apart, then uh, the map equation, assuming that, well, seeing that random walkers get stuck in these isolated corners, identify these isolated corners. Like that's what we told it to do. But then uh, if that's not what you're looking for, you, you, uh, you have some prior knowledge about there are links we can't see. Yes. Uh, so then we have developed like a basin apparatus on top or together integrated with the map equation so we can deal with those cases. So, so it's um, the, the map equation has been my way to kind of absorb new knowledge in, in the field. And sometimes, and those are the lucky days when you, you, can, you can be a little bit ahead and, and kind of um, yeah. Yeah, open new avenues yourself. But I, but I think even on the days that you're not ahead, I think formalizing observations and finding the right mechanism to incorporate them into something like the map equation still is a huge contribution in understanding you know, some, let's say, empirical observation that you're reproducing. I want to talk about one last map equation thing, um, which is one of the things I always loved and I wonder if you have something to say about it, is this idea of also empirical flows that of course kind of the bread and butter of the algorithm has to do with uh, random walks but in fact you can plug in real flows and so, so can you talk a little bit about this and what it does to the communities and 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 your, your thoughts on this because i think this is so important and also because we're all the time getting more and more data and i think this is a kind of really promising avenues to find networks because that reveals even more, right? No, oh. no, so, so the, um, we need to remind us where we came from. So we were working on uh, networks where we consider them as like the, the backbones of, on top of which information can flow. So the network is, sets the constraints on flows. Yes. It can, it's basically, it's re, it, the network is really where there are no links because yeah. there no information can go. Uh, that's why we use the random walk model because with a random walk, you can, you can model what actual flows could look like. But now when we have real flows and past data, um, why not use it? And one of the things you get for free then is this overlapping stuff because you need, you need that. It turns out that if without that, you, you are likely to overfit your, your data. But with those paths, you can um, uh, and use it more uh, effectively and, and learn about the higher order structure. So this is work with, uh, I mean, Renault uh, has been involved. Ingo Schultes has been involved. Has been involved. Um, and um, it's something that started in, uh, I think we, probably the idea was, came right after your paper and then uh, the first paper we did on it was uh, in 2014, or it was published in 2014, but it started long before. Yeah. And uh, be because it's like, it, it is more, you know, I could write down the first algorithms for the InfoMap uh, paper in, um, 
in in a week or so but now when you need to work with so much more data it takes more time to do it efficiently uh, yes you, you and you don't want to like provide a bad algorithm because you, you yeah. need all it, it doesn't work unless you have good math good algorithm and the good visualization to kind of communicate what you found yeah if you only have one of these uh it's not going to be as good and it, it's harder and that's why this uh work progresses slower i think yeah but it's it's super important and it is why like you talked uh, before about writing research applications this is what i put in my research applications this is yes. what i want to do I use real real data i i ever since i kind of thought of this i or heard of you this idea with the with the actual flows i i always thought that the perfect system for this is websites and sequences of clicks collected by the ad agencies that this would be incredibly revealing uh, data to work with. Um, so, so, but I, I don't have that data, so I haven't done it. But I no, but this is like yeah, we are open to collaborations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, an ad. Exactly. Well, someone who has the data, yeah. give us a call and uh, yeah, yes. um, super cool. Okay, then I I just want to get. Um, I guess to round things off, I want to talk about community building, which is also something that I think uh, I've seen you do. Uh, you have this yearly ice lab camp where you work with young students to kind of work with them to build ideas. And, and I guess if we're connecting everything, you've had this incredible mentoring experiences a, a few times over not everyone has it and it seems maybe i'm wrong but it seems that you're systematizing some of this and trying to help kids do that in the ice lab camp is that right yeah 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 so so um, when i when i was a student myself uh with kim um, kim was really good at coming up with ideas but we never asked he never asked questions that was not the way he worked uh, and um when um uh, I met uh, Francois Tadi, and he invited me to a summer camp south of, on a, like a farm south of Paris. And I was yeah. sitting with the uh, French elite master students. Yes. It was a very weird thing, but it was one week of asking research questions and coming up with projects. And it was wonderful because it was, it was like the part of a PhD I didn't get in Copenhagen. It's like it completed uh, yeah. everything, and I've and and I I remember telling myself, when I get a chance, I will do something like this to the next generation researchers, and um, and and it, it it another parallel story was that when I visited Carl the first time, uh, we were sitting on a bus from his home from his house to the lab, and he asked me, so what research questions are you thinking about? And, and I'm like, I'm not thinking about research questions because that wasn't <laughs> my framework. Uh, yeah. But I didn't say that because I, I realized that this is an important question. This is fundamental. Yes. And uh, it's like answering correct here means I will do my postdoc here. And wrong answer means, uh, well, thanks for coming over and uh, good luck <laughs> with your science. So I, I felt like it was... It was um, super important and and Carl taught me how to think in research questions and uh, not everyone got that chance uh, because as students we practice answering questions but as researchers as we talked about you need to ask good questions yeah and um, I like I would say most PhD students don't think about these things so uh, let's, let's do what I was thinking about. Let's organize this camp where we just focus on asking questions, making this transition from being a good student to a good researcher. And with this touch that we want to do it in an interdisciplinary setting so that we bring researchers from many different fields together and they can work out cool projects that none have thought about before, which has also been something I have enjoyed. Like I'm a physicist moving into biology and uh, other fields. And, and really seeing how important this simple algorithm of like taking one idea and another idea and combining them into a new idea is. Yes. Um, and, and that is the idea of Islam Camp. 
Yeah. And no, it's I also think... it's also the idea of the place where I'm working, ICE Lab, Integrated Science Lab, where we have PIs from many different fields working together on modeling, computational modeling and mathematical modeling to kind of break down the boundaries between disciplines. Yeah. No, no, but I think I think it's really important. And I think it's important also just the work in general to prepare people for these intense transitions in science, right? Another topic for uh, next time we chat is exactly like the, then the next transition is like when you go from being a postdoc to being a PI, then it's like a whole new set of skills yes. that you haven't uh, practiced, right? And yeah. I think that's also something that's that I think would be would be important. But I think, you know, like the first step the first step is like learn to ask questions and not to solve them. And then the next step is like learn now to, to, to work through collaboration and so on. And so, so there's and, and also, pictures. yeah. And, and that it's okay to change fields and move between fields. And that can be super powerful. Like when yeah. I, I remember when I, so I went to Copenhagen for my master's project that ended up being my PhD and coming back and presenting that some old professors asked me like so so where is the hamiltonian and that, that was like saying you are not doing physics yes. this has no value and 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 it's also like that the camp is also response to that to yes. say that well you did quantum physics your entire life uh, you you got you got stuck there but the, the cool problems happen in between fields. Yeah, no, absolutely. And there's also a way to have, uh, again, to spark creativity, right? Like one way is to go skiing, but another one is to talk to someone with an inc like a fully different worldview. And when you have to explain your stuff and, and it meets with these ideas that are, are different, then in those cracks and in those tensions, that's where you you realize your own blind spots, right? And, and I think good ideas hide also in the blind spots. That's, yeah, that's yeah. a lot of the exciting stuff. And, and that's why I try to do with my research group. So I, I mean, I have uh, ecologists, paleontologists, geologists, computer scientists, physicists, and, and it's really like uh, sitting together and thinking about how, what can we come up to together? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I will never, I cannot get all the experience um, I need to fully understand what it means to be like a paleontologist, because I will never collect fossils for five years. Mm -hmm. And I think you need to do that to fully appreciate the kind of uh, the millions of years that have passed uh, before we live. But I can uh, invite a paleontologist into the group and he brings all those skills and we can talk about uh, skills that he couldn't spend 10 years achieving, yeah. uh, acquiring. So, so uh, and this is why it's so much fun to go to work because we have all these different skills and we try to communicate and learn from each other. Yes, and I think that's the other thing about science, right? So one is like creating objects of very high quality and then of course the best, uh, the best conversations. Yeah. And, but, but I think that also we should probably wrap it up this good conversation. So thank you so much for, for coming on. It's been, it's been a pleasure and, and, uh, and super exciting. And I hope, uh, I mean, yeah, Dora, the Explorer, uh, was a big part of the map equation. I feel like this is, this is we're also breaking uh, news here, you know, that, uh, will shake yeah. the network science world. Go out, uh, watch Dora and then, uh, sign up for Ice Lab Camp. Exactly. Let's do it. All right. Thank you so much, Brian.